All right, if you would, I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles tonight with me to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. That's after the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, you'll come to the book of 1 Timothy. I want to say welcome to uh, those of you that will be watching by way of Facebook or uh, through YouTube. We're so glad to have you, and uh, we pray that the word preached tonight or the word taught uh, might be uh, helpful to you and you'd be strengthened by it, because uh, that, that is our desire. You know, one of the things, a part of the reason why the Lord gave the office of pastor and teacher to the church was so that the work of the ministry could go forward and that the saints of God might be edified. That means to be built up. And, uh, and if the preaching is not covering those things, then what are we doing here? <laughs> Amen. Our faith might increase. Our confidence might increase. Our personal responsibility and be strengthened with might in the inner man to help us make it during the week. And uh, I want to speak to you tonight about your conscience. Somebody already mentioned it tonight in our fellowship before services started your conscience is an important thing and uh, listen to what this says you're in first timothy chapter one look in verse 18 paul writing to a young preacher he said this charge i commit unto thee son timothy now the reason why he says son timothy now timothy wasn't his son biologically but but timothy was his son spiritually the Apostle Paul was responsible for leading Timothy to the Lord and was grooming him in his journeys and so forth for the preaching ministry, for the pastorate. And that's why, in part, why the books of First and Second Timothy were written and Titus and Philemon, they're considered the pastoral epistles. And I try to make it a point to read through these things frequently because it's what I need. It's the basis of for many of the things in which we do. But here he's charging Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, now watch, that thou mightest war a good warfare. Does anybody remember what I preached last Wednesday night? Oh, good on you. You wrote it down, all right? Leveling the battlefield. It's all right. How many of you remember what you had for breakfast two days ago? <laughs> I get that, all right? And that's why if you're in the habit of taking notes, I recommend it because, you know, somebody said that the dullest, I didn't say this, I just quoted often, the dullest pencil has a better memory than the sharpest mind. And, uh, and by writing it down, you can refer back to it sometimes. And not just because I'm the one that's preaching, but whoever, if you're, if you're in a Sunday school class or, or in preaching services or we have a guest speaker on occasion, man, bring a pencil and paper, write it down. It certainly can help you. A lot of times it's good to go back and look at that because what did he say? I must have missed that right there. What was he trying to say? It's important if you can do that. So, so uh, I recommend that to you. Write it down, write it down. And, uh, and so he wants him to fight the good fight of good warfare. Verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away, that means separated from, concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now these were not lost men, these were saved men, but got so contrawise with God, much like the young man in the book of 1 Corinthians, remember that he was turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit might be saved in that day. That young man wasn't a lost man. Now he was behaving like a lost man, but he wasn't a lost man. And so Paul, that's how Paul dealt with him. And we know that young man was restored. And, uh, and so here, the idea here is about maintaining. How do we maintain a good conscience? Because it seems clear from the text that if, if both ta of Timothy and us, if we're going to fight that good fight, if we're going to wage a good warfare, holding faith and, and, and holding faith and a good conscience are going to be paramount. They're going to be essential. They're going to be imperative to our success. All right. 
And it seems like without them, then it looks like shipwreck is what can happen. And it's, it's likely, it might even be predictable. Predictable. There are just some things that you can't do without. And if we're going to fight the good fight, as we kind of talked about a little bit last week about leveling the battlefield, also then that, that was understanding something about, about our enemy and what to do, but also now what can I do to help myself? What can I do here to, to stay fit as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, right? And so these are some things that we can do. Now, so somebody might say, well, what is your conscience? In the book of Proverbs, it says this. It says the candle, it says that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts. So when you light a candle, what does it do? It sheds light, doesn't it? Do you remember some of you all are, some of you all are, uh, are, let me see, are seasoned enough to remember maybe when they burn candles sometimes. I remember, you know, sometimes even on the Christmas tree, sometimes they had some things. I mean, it was a fire hazard. You know, it's a wonder we didn't didn't set the house on fire. And sometimes that's what they would have or or, or different things. And a lot of people burn candles in their home, but 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 I actually mean use one to walk. And so it would either be in a, what we called a hurricane lamp. Y'all know what those are? I know you don't get hurricanes over here. Isn't, that's a blessing, isn't it? Amen. And, uh, and, and so, but a hurricane lamp and that chimney that's on there, right? That glass chimney, that kept it from blowing out. But, but, but the Bible says that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. What he's talking about there in the Old Testament is a conscience. It is your conscience. And every man has one according to the book of Romans in chapter 2. And so your conscience is that which is in you that judges your actions. It judges your activities. It judges your thoughts. And it judges your words according to the standard, the highest standards that you have. And, uh, and as such, the scriptures describe several different kinds of, of consciences. Man, there's the guilty conscience. You know, I think what comes to my mind is that verse in Proverbs 28, 21, correction, Proverbs 28, verse 1, that says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Now, why does, that, why does the wicked flee when no man pursueth? Why is he always looking over his shoulder? Why? His conscience is bothering him, see? His conscience is bothering him. And, uh, and so then there's the weak conscience that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 8, and this might be someone whose conscience is overly sensitive to things. And Paul tells Timothy about having a pure conscience. There's the seared conscience in 1 Timothy 4. And what's that about? You know, when a, when a soldier was wounded in battle in Roman times, what they would do is they would put a hot poker or a sword or a, a, a knife, a long knife, and they would heat it in the fire, much like a branding iron. And they would try to control the bleeding, but what they would do is they would place that hot knife after it had been in the fire, they would put it right on that wound. I mean, I, that would make you say, boy, howdy, wouldn't it? All right. And uh, it would put it right on there, but something that three things it would do. Number one, it would stop the bleeding. It would stop that. Number two, it would kill any infection that had already set in. And, and number three, it would deaden the nerves in that area because of the fire, because of the burning, to where it sort of it reduced pain in that wound. All right? In other words, that they wouldn't have feeling. And when our conscience is seared, that's a bad way to be. That means when you're past feeling. When you're past feeling about things. There's the defiled conscience. There's the evil conscience that's mentioned in Hebrews 10 and 22. That's the final state of depravity, an evil conscience. And then, of course, there's the good conscience. And that's what we want to talk about, that good conscience that he talks about, holding faith and a good conscience. So how do we do that? How do we maintain it? I can't think of anything in our lives that doesn't need some maintenance. I mean, I can't think of anything like that from the simplest of things that has to have maintenance. One of those things is, one of the ways that you and I maintain a good conscience is to let the Holy Spirit and the Word of God be your guide. 
Now, you know Psalm 119. That's Psalm 119. That's the longest psalm in the, in the Bible. That's the longest chapter in any Bible. It's 100, what, 176 verses that are in there. But in verse 105, it says this. It says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. All right? A lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I've seen that sort of uh, depicted in a drawing where actually on, on, the, on the feet of those oriental eastern persons, they would actually have a little place for a candle to be on their shoes and they would light those and as they walked, those little candles provided light for their steps. And it was a picture of the Word of God. And so, so only the Holy Spirit and the Word of God can be trusted in this world. It's the only things. It is the source of absolute truth. And, you know, I mentioned something about that Sunday morning. And, you know, I said, don't, don't neglect it. Don't correct it. And something else I, I should have said, I thought of it later. Was one of the, have you ever done that? Man, I wish I'd have said that. And so I'm going to give it to you now. Don't deflect it. But let it have its way. Don't put it from you. You know, don't let it be like water off a duck's back. Admit the word of God. And so because it's the only thing that will help us. You know, one of the things about the Holy Spirit, he is our guide, is he not? He's supposed to be our guide and will put us in remembrance. Now, now, have you, how many of you ever heard this statement? Let your conscience be your guide. Maybe you've said it. Yeah, Jiminy Crick, if that's right. That's right. It takes something more than a cartoon character, though, that will help us. Amen. But I think they were doing as best they could do in those days. Mr. Mr. Disney's rolled over in his grave several times with what's happened at Disney. But, but I'm going to say this. Whosoever said, let your conscience be your guide, was foolish indeed. Unless, unless... God is guiding your conscience. Now, God gave you a conscience. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts. It's only when God is guiding the conscience that you and I can trust what it, what it, its leadership, its leading in our lives. Because sometimes, you know, sometimes about your conscience, when you do the right thing, and then it'll beat you up. That ever happened? You said the right thing. You did the right thing. And then you felt bad about it. That's why your conscience, uh, you've heard me say it before, and I'm not trying to repeat it here. I, Brother Roger's the one that, that, told, you know, that gave me this illustration. He said it's a lot like an umpire. An umpire in a baseball game only gets involved after the play. After the fact. And sometimes they don't get it right. That's why they've had to go to videotape now. In baseball games, unheard of. We have to have that. Why? Because the umpires are not always 100% reliable. That's why God gave us the Holy Spirit and the Bible to help guide our steps, to be that lamp unto our feet. Now think about it. Unless God is guiding your conscience, it's not reliable. So, so what does that tell me? Your conscience has to be calibrated. We just had this piano tuned, didn't we? If we hadn't got it tuned, what would have happened? It just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And it'd be out of key and we'd try to sing to it. We'd have a hard, we have a hard enough time when it is in key. Amen. But the bottom line is it has to be tuned. You know, if you, for a, a ham radio operator, if you want to be able to receive the signals from somebody else that's, that's transmitting or whatever, you have to tune the antenna. And if you don't get it tuned, then you're not going to be able to receive the transmissions that are out there in the airwaves. Have you ever wondered about submarines, how they're able to communicate from such great depths and such great distances? Do you know that they drag an antenna behind them? Sometimes it's a few miles in length. Yep. That's how you tune an antenna, like the 10 meter band or the two meter band. You know, some of these things, if you get down there to several meters, and in order to tune that to get it where it's just right, where they can, they can transmit no problem, but they can't receive, and they have to have that. And so it's great length might be out there. But nonetheless, it must be tuned. 
And so too our, so too our conscience. I mean, let me ask you a question. Some, do you have, anybody have a sundial in their yard? Have you ever seen a sundial? Do you ever notice anybody going out there at night to see what time it is? Well, if the sundial is in darkness, then how is it, how is it going to guide you and tell you what time it is? The sundial has got to be in the light in order to accurately tell us. So too, your conscience has to be guided in the light if it's going to help us. It has to be calibrated like any compass because, because I mean, it, 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 listen, if, it get, if the compass is faulty, you're going to get off course. And where does the conscience get its signals from? It gets them from the heart, which can be, you know, which can be dulled. It can be hardened. It can be seared. You get that crust on your heart. That's why sometimes, man, when we say, boy, we need revival. What did they say in the Old Testament? When the, one, of the, one of those, right, hey, what, break up your fallow ground, Jeremiah said. What is fallow ground? Fallow ground's what we had out back here, brother. It hadn't been dug up. Now, we buried a gas line out here, but it had, that ground hadn't been dug up, and it took one of those, you know, I've tried, I, I put my shovel in there, and I look just like one of them cartoon characters, you know. Boom, you know, it makes you vibrate the teeth in your head, right? This stuff gets hard as, as anything, and so, but they had to get, we got, we got a little backhoe in here, and Pete had some fun and dug down in there, and, and, uh, and, uh, and was scraping that stuff out of there. Why? That ground, it has to be broke up. And the heart can get hard. And that affects the conscience. It affects our conscience. And so, so you and I, we've got to be careful about that. So your conscience, it gets its signals from the heart, which can be dulled, hardened, or seared. And a conscience can even be overly sensitive to things. <clears throat> which is another error and could even drive one mad. Do you know that Shakespeare wrote this? You know, Shakespeare wrote, he said, conscience doth make cowards of us all. When you don't have any confidence, when your heart, you know, sort of betrays you in that, it's hard for us to take on things, particularly in the spiritual realm. That's where, that's where 1 John wrote, or when John wrote in 1 John, he said, if our heart condemns us not, What's he talking about there? He's talking about the conscience. We have our petitions then. When I bring them, if I know there's nothing between me and God, my conscience is void of offense, then I can have my petitions. I know that they're going to be heard, and the Lord will help me. The Lord will help me. So, number one, let the Holy Spirit and the Word of God be your guide. Let it tune your heart. That way you'll receive the right things. And your conscience won't bother you. Number two, you and I, we must limit our exposure to evil. We must limit our exposure to evil. You know, it's been a few years since I have been to New Guinea. I think it was 10 years. I went, you know, this past fall in uh, 22. And that was a privilege to go. But something I always notice whenever I go there, particularly in the highlands, I always notice the feet of the men. Because nobody up there, man, woman, boy or girl, nobody wears shoes. And their feet are all very wide, and they are thickly calloused. And you say, how'd they get that? They got that from being in contact with the rough terrain that is up there in New Guinea. And, you know, we think about that, my, oh, my, how do they get by? Well, it's just the way a lot of us used to do when we were little. You know, man, I would have to tell my kids, we're getting ready, you know, as soon as they got in the car, the shoes came off. It was a constant battle. You know, I tell them, hey, put your shoes on. We're almost home. You know, you know got to get the shoes off. And so, you know, you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't get the country out of the boy, right? And, uh, and so, too, you know, so when we were little, what you do? You could run on anything. It didn't matter if it, was, if it wasn't too hot, the pavement or whatever, but you could run on the rocks. Even, even those little, uh, the, the, uh, the thistles that are out here in the grass wouldn't necessarily get you. It might be in the bottom of your foot, around your heel or something, but you didn't feel it. Why? Because you've been in contact with the world, the big ball, you know. I used to golf and sometimes I would hit fat. Do you know what that means? Any of you that golf, did you ever golf, Brother Ed? It's not like shoeing horses, all right? I will tell you that. When you hit fat, that's when you come down with your swing and you hit the big ball before you hit the little ball. The big ball is the ground. And, uh, and so why? how did their feet get that way? Because they've been in contact with the world. 
And so the more that we are around evil, beloved, it has a tendency to callous us. And we have to be careful about that. Listen, we are exposed today. Our young people are exposed to more open wickedness now than in any previous generation. Now listen, since the beginning of time, ever since Adam fell, men and women have been sinners in need of salvation. Amen. Would you agree with me about that? But what they did a lot of times, it was done in other places, in places where a lot of other people didn't travel. They certainly didn't brag about it. They didn't parade about it. They didn't brandish it in a lot of places. But today, man, they glory in it. They revel in it. I, for me, I, I even think it's worse than in the days of Lot. Because it was sort of confined to one place. It was Sodom and Gomorrah. It wasn't everywhere in the land, but it seems to be everywhere in our land here. I mean, I just read today, I read today on January 25th of this year that Pope Francis said that sodomy is not a, uh, is not a crime and that the Catholic Church should receive them into the church because we are all God's children. Beloved, we are not all God's children. We are not. God is not everyone's father. Only those who have been born again by the Holy Spirit of God are his children. Now, we are all God's creation, but we are not all God's children. That's a lie. And he said that the church should welcome them and that he is against any sort of legislation that would limit them and so forth, whether it be marriage or whatever they want to do, that in charity, that they, that's what they, listen, beloved, love is very broad. It is very broad in its scope, but love does not tolerate evil. Amen. And that's what you and I have to be, we have to be aware of that. You know, the devil's intention is to desensitize the conscience of a nation. And it's people, and, and it's sad to say, it's working. To where people just accept things today that, that, that they at one time never would have. And, uh, and that they condone. Do you remember Lot? I mentioned him. Do you remember Lot? The Bible says in the, in the book of Jude that he was vexed in seeing and hearing their deeds. Vexed. Vexed by it. Uh, you know, when, when Lot, you know, there was a time when Lot offered his daughters to those men. I bet you on the first day when he got to town, he wouldn't have done that, but he did that. How in the world is that possible? Why would he do that? Why? Because what he was seeing, what he was being around, what he was exposed to all the time, day in, day out, it was having an effect upon him. And that's what we have to be careful of. Now listen, God hasn't taught, doesn't want us to be isolated. It's not what I'm teaching tonight. But he does want us to be insulated and we have to protect our conscience from some of these things. And so what that means is, is that we have to be careful that we don't have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. That's what he told them in the book of Ephesians. He said, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. And so our conversations, you know, we have to be careful about those things. That's why, that's why some of the things, you know, uh, you know, some of the things are just not worth talking about. Why? Because the more they get, the more they get talked about, the more that we are aware of them, the more that they find their way into our thinking and into our being. So that when we see it someplace, oh, that must be what they're talking about. Well, you know, that doesn't look all that bad. It happens. Listen, churches, listen, uh, you know, uh, I'll guarantee you, if we put a band in here and, and, and we kick the doors down on some things doctrinally in here just said everything goes and just call it all in the name of God, we, I would venture to say that we would have a few more people than what we typically have. But we're not going to do that by the grace of God. I'm not doing that. Because there are some things that are just not for sale. So what we have to ask ourselves, if we're going to limit our exposure, because... I didn't take you to the passage, but it's in the book of Romans in chapter 16, if you write it down, verses 18 and 19. What Paul told the church there in Rome, 
He said, be simple concerning that which is evil. Be simple. And, uh, and, and you know, and so mom, moms and dads, grandma and grandpa, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you have to ask your kids, could I see your phone? Yeah. Well, why do you want to see that? Well, I want to see what you're looking at. You know, when they when when they were at home in our house, that you know, you weren't going to lock me out of your bedroom. Now, granted, I may not have wanted to go in there, <laughs> but uh, but we would try to make sure that they did clean them. But uh, but it was we weren't going to have you know you weren't going to go into your room, close the door, and turn the music up because you were upset with mom or dad, or grandma or grandpa. I wasn't having it. Don't do that. Don't be a facilitator. Be involved. Limit your exposure. Limit your exposure. So you have to ask yourself, have I given up any ground where I once stood firm? I have to ask myself, am I tolerating things now that I at one time would not tolerate? You have to ask yourself about that. Are you still able to blush? The Bible calls it shamefacedness. Are you still able to blush? Do you still feel guilty sometimes? I would say that's good. Because it's not good if your conscience never bothers you about anything. So number one, let the Holy Spirit and the Word of God be your guide. Number two, limit your exposure to evil. And then number three, we go to Acts. Go to go to the book of Acts with me and look in chapter twenty-four. Acts twenty-four and look with me, please. Turn left in your Bible. Acts twenty-four and look in verse sixteen. I'm trying to help you tonight, but you've got to be able to help yourself. It's sort of like you know, get you know. If my mother, you know, there was a time when they did cut my food up, but I don't ever recall, and I, I hope it's always kept from my memory, that my mother used to chew my meat before she gave it to me. Gross. Uh, you know, I didn't, we didn't do that with our kids, and uh, I, hope that, I hope my parents didn't do that with me and mine, all right? And, uh, but, you know, but there came a time when it would be kind of like, hey, you know how to cut your own food? Right? You know how to cut your own meat. Get that knife and fork. Learn how to use them. And, uh, and so that's what, that's what we have to do. That's what we're trying to do here. Is, uh, is where we're not being spoon fed. But where you have to help yourself. Where you have to cut your own food so to speak. So let the Holy Spirit and the word of God work together to guide you. Number two. Limit your exposure to evil. Take the, uh, the insulation that God provides in his word by coming to the house of God. By, as you read your Bible, you'll begin to understand the will of God and then begin to think like him. Having his viewpoint about the world and about the needs that are there. That will help you. And then number three, learn to exercise your conscience. I ask you to go to Acts 24. Look with me in verse 16. Well, notice what Paul said. Herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. What does void mean? It means to be empty, to have nothing. So in other words, you know, we, we, we sing that song sometimes, nothing between me and my Savior, nothing. There's nothing between. And, uh, and Paul lived a life where there was nothing between he and his heavenly father and nothing between he and any other person around him. If something showed up, he dealt with it and he exercised his conscience. He didn't ignore it. He, he didn't uh, try to silence it. You know, uh, there were some men when I was, uh, when I was in the military, I was a part of what I did was an air traffic controller. And my boss, the tower chief at the time, uh, when he, he was one of those guys, maybe if you've ever seen an old war movie or whatever, and you look at it, and he was those, one of those guys who was a plotter, a plotter in the military. I don't know if you had those in the army or not. They probably did. 
but he was a plotter and he could write backwards. He would have a grease pencil and he would have a plexiglass board, a plexiglass board with some sort of pattern or grid on it. It might have been a map. And so when they were doing certain things, he had a headset on and a, and a microphone here and they would tell him something and he would write it there. But he had to learn to write all the numbers backwards. He could do all that so that the leaders, so the people that were in charge would look on the other side and they could read those letters and those numbers. And that was his job. And I, I think he got bored with that, but, but it was interesting to watch him. He could write backwards, man. It was, it was cool. You know how he could do it and did it very well. But Fred became an air traffic controller. And, uh, and so his first day, he, he, he cross-trained. His first day, he goes up in the tower there at Galena, which is in Alaska. And he goes up there, and, and, uh, and what happens, he's talking to the tower chief. Yes, I've got orders for here. Tech school hadn't, but I've been assigned here. And he's talking to him and everything. And two guys are working, and Fred's standing there, green as grass, doesn't know anything about anything, but he knows that planes are not supposed to crash. And on landing, and sure enough, here come two F-89s that came right here, and they came across that approach end, and they snagged the barrier that was up that shouldn't have been there, and uh, they cartwheeled down the runway, the pair of them, and those planes blew up, killed both pilots instantly. And of course, he was like, and he just sort of backed away in the corner. What they found out was that whenever that barrier was in the wrong position, if you had to switch ends of the runway because of the wind, if you switched that to that, that now being the approach end, you had to lower that barrier there and raise the one at the departure end so that they could be snagged if they would overrun. You wouldn't have it up on the approach end, but what did they do? Those men that were working there and all the controllers, they got tired of the noise, the alarm. So as soon as you turned into the runway, an alarm would sound if you hadn't lowered the barrier. And they got tired of listening to it. So they took tissue paper and they stuffed it down there and that little tiny speaker to where they couldn't hear it. And that's what we do sometimes with our conscience. Our conscience bothers us and we ignore it. It's called violating your conscience. To violate it. Your conscience has got a sign, got, got, a, got, a, got a lantern up here saying, Stop! Stop! Don't come this way! Stop! Stop! The Holy Spirit says, Stop! And what do you do? We just run right over it. And you violate your conscience. You can't do that, beloved. Listen, if you do that, you're, you're gonna lose, your peace is going to be like that dove. It's going to take wings and fly away. You're not going to have peace. You are going to have regret. You'll probably have some restless or sleepless nights because of it. You know, sometimes you say to yourself, well, I shouldn't have said that to him or to her. Well, if that's true then act upon it. Go make it right. Do what you have to do to make it right. Confess, repent, and, uh, and then act upon it. Follow through. Do what it takes to make it right. Go apologize. Make restitution if necessary. But that's part of exercising your conscience. Beloved, you just can't ignore it. I mean, how do you think those people became reprobates in Romans chapter 1? How do you think that happened? Their conscience became darkened. Why? Because they kept going on against the knowledge of God. And what happens? The Bible says their foolish hearts were darkened. They rejected those things. They kept violating their own conscience and going in that direction. And they became reprobate. That didn't happen on the first day. That happened over time. And so, beloved, we've got to be careful about that. Make restitution. Just don't ignore it. Now, I'm going to be done here. John MacArthur has a book called The Vanishing Conscience. I've got it, and I've started reading it. And in there, he gave this illustration. True story. In 1984, in Spain, there was a horrible uh, airplane wreck. A, a plane crashed, and the airplane plowed into a side of the mountain, and everybody on board was killed in what happened. And, you know, there's something inside the aircraft. Have you ever heard about the black box? that they have these in commercial airlines and it can tell it can tell at the moment when things happen it records timestamps and records voices even the angles 
and uh, of uh, of the ailerons and the flaps and what was the what was the orientation of the aircraft they could they could take all that put all that back together and uh, and so they found the black box and 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 of course it records what happens in the cockpit and uh, and and there was an eerie sound there was an eerie thing that they found when they listened to the recorder it says that because there was a voice that came on in english and the voice said in sort of a shrill way pull up pull up pull up pull up and then the black and then the black box recorded the pilot of that airline saying shut up gringo shut up gringo he thought that the that the that the plane or that the box of that that what was happening in the aircraft was malfunctioning so he reached up there and he flipped the switch and shut it off so he didn't have to listen to the voice and when he did that he overrode the warning system and plowed right into the side of a mountain and everybody on there died now i i didn't say that i hope that wasn't offensive to anyone here but I, my point is, is that people ignore things a lot. And God's given us a warning system. That's your conscience. That's your conscience. Beloved, take care of it. Do your best to see to it that it's healthy. And if it bothers you about something, then act upon it. Go to the Word of God and find out if the conscience is right or not. Because sometimes your conscience will condemn you when you haven't done anything wrong. Go to the Word of God. Let that be your guide, right? Don't, if, you know, if you've been in the dark, your, your sundial's not going to help you. Get some light on that situation. Amen? And so let's maintain a good conscience. That'll be our part. Leveling the battlefield. We've got to recognize some things. We've got to, we've got to understand some things about our enemy. And now we've got to understand some things if we're going to be a good soldier. And not make shipwreck out of our life. So it seems like Paul wanted Timothy to be a good soldier as well as a good sailor. Amen. And we got to do both. All right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the precious word of God. Thank you for these truths, Lord, that we find in the Bible. And help us, Lord. And we know, Lord, that you can heal the conscience. Help us to do our part, like Paul, to exercise it, to be void of offense. Help us to keep a short account with you and with those around us. We love you tonight. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness and goodness, Lord. And I thank you, Father, that cleansing and forgiveness is available. And uh, we ask these things tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.